Well, Bruce, we are now on our 22nd episode of Positively Trek. How do you think it's going so far? Uh, it's going well for 22. Yeah, not too bad. <laughs> Can, uh, it's been able to drink for a year now in, in the U.S., so that's cool. Yeah, we can legally drink on this podcast now. After the last episode, we're good to go. Excellent. Well, I think that's going to work really well for tonight. Uh, we've got a couple of guests joining us. Drinking buddies? Is that what you're trying to say? I, I've known them to do that on occasion, I think. Well, welcome everyone to Positively Trek. I'm Dan Gunther, and with me, of course, as always, is Bruce Gibson. As a lot of you know, we, of course, have our other podcast that we're wrapping up, uh, our time as hosts of Literary Treks. And on that show, we've had the opportunity to talk to authors and other Star Trek luminaries. And one of our frequent and favorite guests, of course, is Dayton Ward, And we're honored to have him here tonight, along with his often writing partner, Kevin Dilmore. So, gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us on Positively Trek. Thanks for having us. Yeah, I'm very happy to be here. Excellent. Well, welcome to the show. Uh, This is going to be fun because we're so used to just talking about the books and comics, and that is something that we are, of course, going to be doing on the podcast in the future as we move away from literary treks, but... For this episode, we wanted to get you guys on the show as general Star Trek experts. And I'm sure, of course, uh, your time as writers will come up and and we'll incorporate that as well. But, you know, just speaking as two people who are passionate about Star Trek, you guys obviously love Star Trek. You do a lot of work in that series and it's been part of your personal and professional lives. Just kind of wanted your perspectives as Star Trek professional fans, I guess. Well, I'm sure we can come up with something. <laughs> they're professional <laughs> fans and they're experts. Yeah, I, we're, I really appreciate you guys coming on as experts because as we went down through the list of experts and they all said no, I'm glad you guys finally said yes. I was going to say, you're, here it is, episode 22, and you're just now asking me to be on the show. Yeah, I know where I'm at, the pecking order. Uh, we we want to save the best for not last, but you know, we, we want to work out all the kinks with the other people and then get to the good stuff. Oh, well, there you go. That's 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 pleasant. And now that I've just insulted all of our previous guests on the show. <laughs> I was going to say, guests 1 through 21 hate you right now. That's all right, though. But you're the first authors that we've had. Oh, wow. Okay, well, that's fun. So there you go. See, now they're, now they're happier, Dan. <laughs> they're glad to be here. Excellent. Bruce is helping me out and, and digging me out of the hole there. Well, I guess the biggest news right now, of course, is we recently had the Lower Decks trailer. And I did want to talk about that a little bit. So the two of you, of course, have had a chance to see the trailer and learn a lot about what the show is about. And of course, through some other means as well that, you know, we're not necessarily privy to. I was wondering if we could get your thoughts on what you think about the trailer and and the direction you think Lower Decks is heading. The easy part is that I'm the audience that they want. I mean, you know, they, they, I feel like that when I was watching that trailer, there were a lot of jokes and a lot of, you know, the, the character stylings and things. They're, they're catering to me. With Mike McMahon, I've had the, the my experience with him was, uh, you know, being a uh, co-creator before that of Solar Opposites, which is airing on Hulu right now that I'm really enjoying. And before that, he worked on, uh, Rick and Morty, which uh, I have been a huge fan of almost, you know, from the time I watched the pilot. And then uh, his work on the on his uh, Next Generation Twitter account, where he had uh, theorized this whole uh, eighth season and had done it in uh, tweets. And I had a chance even to meet uh, Mike once at uh, Comic-Con, uh, Ed Schlesinger, who is uh, the editor for uh, my and Dayton's shared works and Dayton's soloed works at uh, uh, Pocket Books, um, also edited Mike's paperback compilation of those tweets, which I am not going to remember the title. Dayton, do you remember? It's called Warped. I, you know, I'm, I'm pre-sold. I mean, I think Mike, I know Mike knows Star Trek. I know Mike knows funny. The trailer has certainly given me um, ideas that we're going to see jokes that uh, transcend Star Trek into just simply being jokes and that jokes that are going to be funny because uh, the wink, wink, nudge, nudge to the people that have the working knowledge of it that uh, that fans are going to have. It's a great question whether this show will end up being an entry point into Star Trek for someone uh, as the uh, filmation 
animated series of the 70s was an entry point for me. Uh, I don't know if it's just going to be too inside baseball for a fan or not. All I know is that it's going to work for, I'm confident it's going to work for me and I'm very eager to watch. I know I have seen online a few people saying like uh, family members saw the trailer and they're definitely going to watch it and they've never watched Star Trek before. So I, I think that's definitely something that this could serve to do. I know one of the big complaints that people have had, and it's a completely baseless complaint with the new Star Trek shows starting with Discovery is that the writers don't know Star Trek. And that's definitely not the case for Discovery or Picard writers. But I think it's very obviously not the case for Lower Decks. Like it's so like that trailer just oozes Star Trek knowledge, I think. Yeah, he knows his Star Trek. I think if the trailer didn't quite land on one thing, it's that it oversold it, it concentrated a lot on the humorous aspects of this and i think it's kind of under underplaying that there is a heart to this show there is a star trek heart beating there beneath that skin um and the references to various previous star trek adventures if you want to call it or references to characters and things are they're littered through these scripts it is ridiculous there are sight gags there are easter eggs and dialogue there are casual off-the-cuff references that hardcore fans will get and they'll be able to look each other and nod and fist bump because they're like <laughs> we got that one no it's it's really it's uh it's uh amazing how much they bake into 30 minutes uh for these shows at least the ones i've read so far yeah and that doesn't shock me because the the, the uh solar opposites and rick and morty just feels like that they are just, you know, I mean, using, you know, shimmies to, you know, to, to jam in one more joke and it is uh, rapid fire, but yet it all feels like it belongs. Right. That's, and I think that's going to, you're going to see a lot of that here. I mean, there's, there's going to be some jokes. There's going to be some, you know, there's going to be a lot of that kind of stuff, but they, the Star Trek stories are being told in this format. I think it's just a, it's almost subversive and how it's going to slide Star Trek in when you think you're you're clear of it. <laughs> it's, you know, you think you made it out and it's right there between the ribs, Star Trek. So, um, it's no, it's really cool. It's uh, I was uh, I was I will admit when I first heard about the show, I was a skeptic. I was like, I don't know about this, even though I'm on record as saying I really like it when Star Trek embraces whimsy and even a little absurdity, particularly on the merchandising side. So. Um, I was pleasantly surprised when I started to look at material related to the show. I'm like, yeah, this is going to be fun. It's going to be different, but it's going to be fun. There could be that one episode where everybody's saying, hey, that episode of Lower Decks is actually some of the best Star Trek ever. Yeah, I mean, it's it's kind of like uh, the, the short Trek, you know, the animated short Trek, Eat, Brain, and Dot, that is just eight minutes of pure whimsy. And I think it's fun. I just think it's a fun little little thing that, that my kids enjoyed and I dug it because it just, it just threw caution to the wind and had some fun with the things that we all know. I mean, we all know every scene down to the last frame of film that was baked into that eight minutes. And that's the kind of stuff that I like. I like, I like the fact that it embraces it and, and turns a little bit on its head. You know, it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be slavishly uh, following every last detail, but uh, I, and it was relevant animation. I mean, as far as the styles and the uh, and, and the storytelling techniques were modern. Um, you know, I I you know will die on the hill as the last fan of uh, of filmation if uh, if you let me. I mean, there are times that uh, you can't necessarily call that show animated. <laughs> You know, um, but that was and it was budget constraints and it was uh, the way filmation runs their house. I mean, you know, it, you know, it's, you know, well, you know, we don't have the time to animate uh, three new lines of dialogue. Well, then shove his face right up next to the camera. He won't even see his mouth. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's, you know, it's, which in a sense is kind of brilliant. But uh, um, the, the F. Raymond Dot, I just I watched that thing and I don't think I took a breath in eight minutes because I was so excited for what, what it was doing and it paid off in ways I didn't imagine. And I'm hopeful that, uh, you know, and, and like anything else, you know, no show is going to bat a thousand. Um, but I'm hopeful that I'm going to find things in every episode that I'm going to think, gosh, I'm so glad they did that. Mm -hmm. I'm so looking forward to uh, one of the things I do on my YouTube channel is canon connections and Easter eggs for episodes, you know, of discovery and Picard 
which like those videos were long enough. My Easter eggs video for this trailer that we just got was half an hour. Like you better stretch. <laughs> you better stretch and carb up for this. Yeah, it's going to be nuts. Like if that's how much is in the trailer, I can't imagine what an average episode is going to look like. And I'm here for it. I am down. <laughs> that's part of the fun. I mean, you know, I'm, I want Star Trek to be fun. Dayton and I have talked for, I mean, you know, we've been working together for close to 20 years now. And that's the one thing we always talk about is why can't, why can't Star Trek be fun? Like fill in the blank of the franchise because you can almost put in any other blank of the franchise. No, I, I feel the same way. I, I, like I said, I've always liked it when they, when they loosen up a little bit and, and, and embrace the fun that you can have within the format. So I'm, I'm, looking forward to seeing what happens when you take you know the governor completely off and let it roll at full speed uh, it'll be interesting to see I, I know some people are going to be freaking out purists are going to have a heyday that youtube videos are going to you know be out there and that's just the way that goes yeah that just tells me there's people that can't have fun because all four of us are huge hardcore star trek fans and we can enjoy this and we can enjoy spoofs and a little humor and a little poking at fun and whatever i mean some people just take it i think too seriously there there are the people who are mad at shatner because he said get a life on saturday night live you know and then there's the rest of us who laughed well one thing i see people uh having questions about with regards to lower decks is it canon i know mike mcmahon has come out and answered that question i think fairly definitively and said yes it is canon it's part of the star trek story it will fit in with star trek and and what comes before and what comes after it it is a part of that so i was wondering if you guys had any kind of thoughts on that like do you do you see this as a problem this show trying to fit its way into canon or is it something that you know you think should be fairly seamless i think it's fairly seamless having having read you know the first dozen scripts and seen where they're going with it and how it fits in and there will be references that will help lock in that idea i mean it's not it's one thing for him to say it it's another thing for him to demonstrate it on screen and that will be demonstrated on screen i think i think uh, even the hardcorest of hardcore fans will not be able to dispute it it's i don't know why the resist i know the resistance is it's animated one and two it's lighthearted and very humorous compared to other star treks and i don't know why that would be a disqualifying factor you know either one of those we accept the animated series now as part of the canon the original animated series so i don't know why this is a quantum leap in terms of thinking uh the animation style is a little off-putting but to some people but i think once you actually see the show and not just a trailer and you get used to the style i think you're going to not pay attention to that you're going to be concentrating on the characters and the stories and where i land on it is that sometimes it's a little too soon to tell i mean how many years passed between the you know 1970s animated series and someone deciding that these episodes and these references are the ones that are going to be you know the the you know stake in the ground definitive you know, uh, names or timelines or actions. And I think a lot of it has to do with how they were embraced by the fans. I don't think people would put up much of an argument that the cons- the general consensus um, is that Yesteryear by Dorothy Fontana is the, uh, is, is the favorite and, you know, best, quote unquote, uh, episode of the animated series. And there's a number of things in, you know, I mean, occurrences and and uh, references that are in that episode that have been embraced, probably because they were dragged into either fiction um, from pocketbooks uh, uh, or even, uh, you know, maybe Bantam back in the day. Writers liked it, so they worked it in, and fan fiction writers liked it, and they worked it in. And and some of it was even pulled into the uh, 2009 feature film. I mean, if, if fans appreciate it, and other Star Trek professionals appreciate it enough, to weave it in, then that's going to be the establishment of, of what, you know, becomes quote unquote canon. Dayton and I have said before that writing a Star Trek book is kind of like uh, sewing a block into a massive quilt. Uh, once in a while, we get a chance to sew a block in next to a couple of adjoining blocks and, and help it fit as seamlessly as possible. I always appreciate it when another writer, whether it's uh, prose or, uh, you know, a teleplay or, you know, anything, just takes that minute 
to say, you know, I'm sure someone has said this. I could just throw a random star date in there, or maybe I could put a star date in that actually helps fit it. And when somebody takes the time and, and, and shows the respect to what's gone before and, what's, and shows respect to the fans who pay attention to this stuff to try to get that right, that speaks a lot to me as a fan that I'm going to give that writer's work a little bit more credence because they're trying. And, you know, that's and, and with Dayton's role in this now, to me, that I think that's the biggest signal in the 40 some years that I've been a fan of Star Trek, that these people really do want to respect what we value in, in these franchises. So I, I think Lower Decks is trying hard to respect stuff. And, and that's why it's canon. It's not canon because I told you so. Well, that's one of the main reasons why we had you guys on. We were inviting you to really talk and dig into canon and what is canon, not just about Lower Decks, but just in general with Star Trek. And I guess I really want to dig into this, and it almost sounds like canon is a value proposition, but what is the definition of canon just in general? Not in Star Trek, but what is canon? What's the definition of canon? Canon is disease and danger wrapped in darkness and silence. <laughs> Can- canon, technically, uh, in, in the Star Trek world, which I think is different from the Star Wars world and maybe other worlds too, is if it happens on screen. Yeah. Anything that goes on in print can be disregarded. But Discovery took a, 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 an approach that, you know, where they very much wanted to tightly coordinate. Is that fair to say? That's fair to say. <laughs> Reality asserted itself, but that's fair to say. They, they had noble intentions. The idea was that not necessarily that the books and comics would be canon, but that the books and comics would be very, co- you know, well, they would be closely coordinated with people who actually work on the show and have buy-in in terms of how these stories can dovetail together. Now, ultimately, the people who run the shows decide whether, you know, they want to remember those books a year from now or whatever, and or if they decide they want to go in a direction that's going to walk all over one of those comics or something. That's that's their prerogative. That's what you get paid big showrunner money to do. Uh, you know, as far as the franchise is concerned, it's what's on screen is canon and what's on print or in video games or in role-playing games or whatever that is ancillary material. It's officially blessed. You know, it does go through CBS licensing and, and, or consumer products and it does get blessed. And in the case of the secret hideout shows, there is a layer of, you know, verification and, and authorization and approval that is, you know, also in play, but it's not like I'm going to write the definitive Giorgio Lorca story and have it be that way for all time. If they decide that there's a great story to be told how Lorca and Giorgio first met, they're going to write that story and shoot it. And that's going to be the canon version of those events. Okay. So then you're sitting there and you're as a, you as a writer saying, okay, I have to be true to what's on screen. That's canon. I can't contradict that. So why, why are fans so obsessed with canon? If you already know the rules, I don't know. (laughs) I don't know. No. uh, Yeah. They, um, we're required to observe the canon and, and stay faithful to the canon as it's known at the time of writing. Our, our story you know and if things change a year after that book is published then that's what happens that's that's life in the big leagues and that's every tie-in writer who's ever written a tie-in knows how that goes that's just part of the job and you know that going in there are no surprises i mean i've had books contradicted we, kevin and i've had stories contradicted by later episodes of some one of the shows or a, a later film and that's just the way that goes that's that's part and parcel of a tie-in writer's life yeah, the one that comes to mind immediately is the very first thing we collaborated on, which was Interface from Starfleet Corps of Engineers, where you know a group of 24th century uh, engineers were able to figure out how to extract the 23rd century Defiant from the broken space and 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 bring it back in. You know, Enterprise rolls around and they do what I think is an awesome idea of kicking that ship not only back in time, but into the mirror universe, which actually led Dayton and I to write another book. So, you know, who cares? But uh, people were asking us, aren't you mad? And I said, well, I'd be mad if they made me send back the money they paid us to write the story. But since they're not, I'm okay. I'm okay with it. I mean, I'm proud of the story. I'm still happy with the story. I like what we did. Of course, we didn't know. We had no idea at the time that they were going to do that. We wrote the story, and then you know, five years later, here's this episode that takes the ship in a different direction. And then, of course, you know, sixteen odd years later, 
that becomes a plot point in a completely different television show. You know, so that's the way this works. It's just, you, you know, going in that there's a possibility that your work might be contradicted by something else. If not something else on screen, then somebody else from another, you know, five years down the road, 10 years down the road, some other author is going to have an awesome idea on how to do this. And it might be a different editor and a different publisher. And they decide that's how they're going to go. They're going to go with this new guy's direction or this new writer's direction, or the comics are going to come up with their own version of a story or the video games are going to come up with their own version of a story. So that's just the way Star Trek has always operated. It's what's on screen is Canon and the different material is, you know, obliged to follow the on screen material, but not necessarily be in lockstep with everybody else who's creating a tie in product. So, you know, like the comics are not required to be in step with the novels, and the novels are not required to adhere to what the games are doing. All three of those things serve different audiences. There is some overlap, of course, but, you know, by and large, comic re- book re- readers may not read the novels, and the novel readers may not play the games and, and all around. So each of those three platforms needs the freedom to to create a Star Trek product that best serves their audience. And why should Star Trek Online not be able to use the Borg, you know, because the books did something to turn them, you know, to make them no longer relevant 10 years ago. That's not fair. It's not fair to the people who are paying the licensing agreement to make those games. And it's not fair to the people who want to play those games and don't read the books and don't care. So that's, that's the thinking. I view what you see on screen as the actual things that happen to these characters, the, the true history of what happened to these characters. I see books and comics and other story, you know, other narratives that are told in ancillary media to be sort of like historical fiction featuring these characters. And so it's kind of like when they used to write dime novels about Billy the Kid or Elliot Ness. You know, these are these are fictional stories based on real characters. Well, that's one way of looking at it for Star Trek. And to be and to really put a cap around that idea, Christopher Bennett, that clever bastard, beat me to that very idea when he had it in his most recent novel where he has Sulu and Uhura talking about, did you see how they're writing books about our adventures? <laughs> or they're publishing books? And I'm like, that is brilliant. Why did not, yep. why did nobody, why did none of us come up with that before now? Uh, Chekhov saying, my accent was never that bad. <laughs> <laughs> right exactly yeah it's actually it's really funny it's a, it's a moment in the book and he didn't need to put that in there and it doesn't necessarily drive the plot but it's hilarious it's a perfect and i'm like i should laminate that page and stick it on the wall it's perfect <laughs> uh, but now one thing that star trek has done a little bit of that i would think would be great if they would do more of i'm not i'm very much a dc person not a marvel person but i loved what if I love the comic series, What If, um, where they would say, you know, what if the Fantastic Four got different powers? Or what if this happened? And or what, if, what if Bucky survived World War II? Or whatever. I think it'd be really fun to do more of what if this went down instead of that? And let comic uh, creators or writers or hell, even short tracks. I mean, what if there was, I mean, they're talking about for Disney Plus doing a what if TV series. What if there was an episode of Short Tracks that was, uh, here's the place where history, you know, shook out differently. I think that Star Trek has not uh, done that kind of thing as much, but I'd, I'd love it. The idea of a what if concept for Star Trek, whether, whether it's comics or a short, you know, I'd love, it'd be a perfect ebook uh, kind of thing. But uh, it definitely Short Treks, if they ever decided they wanted to go in that route. Uh, I think Short Treks is a nice test bed for these kinds of off-the-wall, experimental, unconventional stories. I, I just wonder if they feel that fans would not accept something like that. Because it just seems to be so much intensity about things being consistent, being canon, and if it doesn't fit. I think the majority of fans are open-minded enough that they'll accept these types of stories. If you explain what it is, I mean, if you just throw them in the deep end and and don't explain what you're doing. That's one thing. But I think if you tell them, you know, this is going to be a platform where we can examine the other side of the coin or, you know, the, the road not taken. I think, I, I think fans are, they're, they're more understanding and smarter than we sometimes may give certain segments of fandom credit for, but. You never know what people have going on in their worlds and um, where they find their escape. Um, you know, I mean, I've, I have talked to people, in fact, Dayton will probably remember this. We were in Colorado once doing a signing. And a guy came up to us and said that he does intake at a mental hospital and sees people at their absolute worst. And he does it for eight hours a day and it drains him and it saddens him. And, you know, he he basically limps home and then he picks up a Star Trek book and finds hope and finds fun, finds escape. 
and he goes to bed and gets up and does it all over again. I mean, hell, I'll write books for that guy the rest of my life because what he's doing is huge compared to what we're doing. And so there's a lot of people that this is what, this is kind of what they have. Um, they don't, they, you know, there's other avenues in their life that haven't worked out or, or opportunities that they weren't given. And, and this is what they have. And they've invested a lot of themselves in it. And um, when we change something that is part of their mind, they're reactive. And I get it. And I certainly would never do something just to poke that bear. But sometimes that's just, you know, when I see people going off online, um, I just have to remember, you know, this, for whatever reason, this thing in their head um, that, you know, I mean, how many people wrote the scenes of the Riker Troy wedding before it showed up? And, uh, you know, well, that's not the way in my head it should have gone. And Star Wars, to be honest, I think suffers from it even worse than Star Trek in a lot of ways. You know, that's not how things should have gone. So that, that's, I, I'm very happy to extend grace until uh, you run across a fan that is uh, using knowledge of canon and adherence to canon as leverage to keep somebody else out as uh, when they're when they're using it as an opportunity to to tell somebody that he or she is not a true fan you know a, a, i mean registered trademark true fan when people use their adherence to canon their knowledge of canon as opportunities to shame somebody out of fandom that i do not accept i i mean i agree i just i don't i don't understand the the need to to invest so much in what is essentially mythology it's all fiction it's all fiction and, and 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 for it to be this consistent after 50 plus years across you know thousands of stories told across multiple platforms by hundreds of different writers for it to hang together as well as it does is remarkable you know even the people who were making the original show weren't internally consistent with their own mythology and then you know next oh, God, next generation yeah. didn't necessarily dot all the i's and cross the t's perfectly when it came to references you know from before them so you're saying that canon contradicts canon. Yeah, he's going to say, yeah, refer all canon questions to Captain James R. Kirk at the Vulcanian Ambassador's Lodge of the United Earth Space Probe Agency. I mean, you know, it's if you look at the tombstone that Gary Mitchell created for Kirk, Star Trek canon lasted about six weeks. If they make a mistake like that, when they make a mis- like a, a canonical reference mistake, like in dialogue or something, I, I mean, I, I, there seems to be a jump to, to blame it on malice or apathy or not caring and i'm like i don't i don't see that at all you know and i know people are going to call me a shill or whatever but you know bite me um i see these people i talk to them all the time uh, and i get their notes back and they they take the notes that i provide on the scripts you know they've been doing so very nicely to this point and ultimately it's it comes down to what can they afford to do in the time allotted you know that they do a reference shot like why did you use that ship it's like well because you know it cost x thousand dollars to render a new one and this is for a three second shot and i could use that money to do something else so that's the way that goes sometimes. There's harsh realities when it comes to television production and not everything is going to be, you know, in line with our pie in the sky dreams. The idea that these people don't care or could give a damn or they're insulting the fans or whatever, I just, it, it doesn't hold water based on my own observations. I don't, I don't believe in the cloaking device because I know that it's Nomad's head on Sargon's receptacle. <laughs> And yes, the Klingon belt buckles, buckles were bubble wrap. You know, they, if, you, if you use anything else other than bubble wrap, it's a cannon violation. <laughs> I want the shower curtain that I can make the environmental suits out of. I think if you are adhering to the cannon in the very broad strokes, at the very least, and as many of the strokes as you can get, then I can excuse a, a, a really specific reference once in a while. You know what I mean? If it's if I know it's not coming from a position of apathy or not caring, uh, which I don't see. But does it all have to fit together? That's the thing. I mean, going back to what you're saying, I mean, it, I don't know if it has to or not. I think they're endeavoring they're endeavoring to make it fit. You know, the JJ movies are a different animal, and even they provided an explanation for how it fits. You know, it just fits over in the corner. It's in the other wing that we don't visit very often. I think the idea is that they are trying to make it all a cohesive universe on screen. You know, they're, they're, obviously they're making allowances for, you know, advances in film production and how we tell stories now and how things look and how we can build sets and all that sort of thing. Um, I like to think that if Matt Jeffries had the kind of money and the kind of time and access to the materials that the Discovery production crew had to create the Enterprise Bridge, he would have made something close to what we see in those episodes of Discovery. 
I say this as a guy who will die fighting as a, the, the last defender of the original series. You know, I will take that to my grave as I, I'm a diehard original series fan. We'll love it forever. It's still my favorite always will be, but I understand that you have to make allowances for modern audiences. And that means making everything look more high tech and more futuristic and more advanced than we have to now than we have now. That's science fiction. You know, production design is is one aspect of making Star Trek, but I think the, the larger thing for me when it comes to the canon is do the stories fit? Do, is the mythology largely consistent? And I think it I think it definitely hits more than it misses. And I think the misses when they do occur, and they will inevitably occur because just we're all humans and we make mistakes. Um, they're relatively minor, and they can be they can be explained or justified or 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 just ignored depending on what we're talking about i mean i that does that being said i catch them all i mean i sit there and go ah that's not re- quite right but you know I, I get over it well i can tell you my favorite piece of canon to ignore and 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 i don't i would think that darn close to everybody in star trek might agree with me that uh that they didn't have women in command of uh, starfleet vessels in the 23rd century well yeah that's mentioned in turnabout intruder by yeah. janice lester that women can't be star fleet captains well yeah but she was nuts well she was nuts i i disagree with the whole idea because you know in the very first episode that they that gene roddenberry ever wrote captain pike's second command is a woman so she's the first officer of the ship which by definition is she is a captain in training so why would she take a career path that had a ceiling you know, I don't, that doesn't make any sense. Well, canon does contradict itself. Canon contradicts itself. But I mean, <laughs> I think I think the, the, the line can be interpreted as Captain James Kirk's world of starship captains has no room for women. And that's how I like to interpret it. And that's how I like to look at it. The other alternative is it's a crappy line from a crappy episode and it's best left on the scrap heap. Because we have since seen that that's not a problem women commanding starships you know so, you know i think there's at least one show that i know of where she did pretty damn well right. for seven years but know? then there's cases where you've got something that is quote canon because it's on screen but then everyone agrees going forward we're going to ignore that like that yeah line. it happens i mean I, every property has something like that now I, th- I, th- I think star trek doesn't have too many egregious examples of that i mean that seems to be the one that people pop up but i again they they, they seem to ignore the context or at least the potential context of that line. It's like, no, I, I, the idea that Starfleet has a glass ceiling for women in the command track doesn't track at all. It doesn't make any sense. You know, and, and hell in Star Wars, I mean, how often do you hear people talk about midichlorians anymore? Some things are best left alone. I mean, I, I, I don't know of anybody who's actually advocating for the idea that women should not command starships. I've never heard any fan actually push that idea that that has to be true because it was in a, an episode, so it must be canon. I've never heard anybody defend it. I, well, there might be somebody out there. But there that, might be somebody. There but, might That gets to my next point, and Kevin mentioned this earlier, like head canon, personal canon. That doesn't make sense to what we're saying canon is. No, that's that's a whole other thing, and everybody's got – I mean, I have my in my head certain stories from books and comics – actually happened i'm using air quotes as far as i'm concerned they actually happened to these star trek characters but i take that hat off and put on my professional writer hat and i ignore that impulse to remember that kind of thing when i'm writing a tie-in that needs to be following what the shows have established i mean as far as i'm concerned the vanguard books happen dead dead of honor the graphic novel happened turnabout intruder did not happen (laughs) and the children shall lead never happened in any reality ever you know that kind of thing i mean that's that's my head canon but when I when I write a Star Trek novel, I acknowledge that Turnabout Intruder and Anna Children Child Lead happened. And as much as I can within the context of the book I'm writing, Vanguard happened. But I know for a fact the showrunners don't care about Vanguard happening. And I'm probably sure they don't care about Turnabout Intruder either. And that's fine. I don't care. Nobody should care about that episode. I, f- I feel like so many of the arguments online, and I've gotten dragged into them because I guess I'm a sucker for punishment or whatever, about canon and and all this stuff i feel like so many of them could be resolved if you just replace the word canon the way the fans a lot of the fans tend to use it with the word continuity because like canon shouldn't matter to the fans but to me my continuity is yes vanguard happened uh the voyager episode fury did not happen uh etc 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 right like your personal continuity seems to be like that's fine whatever you want those two terms do tend to get used interchangeably. 
uh, and incorrectly in that respect. And I think unless you're writing for one of the shows or writing a licensed tie-in for one of the shows, canon shouldn't matter. If you like the story that was told in comic book X, then that story happened as far as you're concerned for those characters. Captain Kirk did those gold key comics. And in my personal head canon, he sure did. Or at least some of them. Galloping yeah. galaxies. <laughs> exactly. It wouldn't be a conversation with me and Dayton if one of us didn't bring up Kevin Smith. And I always uh, uh, default to the conversations that they had in Dogma, um, where uh, uh, I don't have a belief, but I've got a pretty good idea. And that is the difference between canon and continuity. When you, when you have a belief that, that you're intractable on and, and, and you choose not to let anybody challenge and, and you keep it all protected and this is the thing I believe and it's sacrosanct, that's when people talk about canon like that, I tune out. Yeah, I don't really have much use for those kind of conversations because it's, it's just so closed-minded. I mean, Star Trek is a very robust platform for storytelling and it can accommodate a number of different storytelling styles and approaches and so i just the idea that this is the way it happened period is never ever going to change or we we know everything we need to know about event x and they can never ever shed new light on it from a different perspective that part i don't get i mean a lot of the things that people seem to get upset about is because like i think we talked about earlier they believe that a sequence of events happened in a certain order even though those events were never shown on screen but there's enough there that they connected their dots in a certain way and then a showrunner or a writer for a new show connects the dots in a different way and introduces elements to, you know, other dots to be connected into that, into that framework. And that doesn't work with what they've got in their head is, you know, like Spock was the first Vulcan ever in Starfleet or, uh, you know, that kind of, that kind of thing. It's like, no, you know, it's amazing when you actually say, you know, there's never actually any evidence that Spock was the first Vulcan in Starfleet. That's never been mentioned anywhere ever. And, and their faces just kind of freeze. Everyone acts as if all of Star Trek is supposed to fit together as if every series is the next episode in a past series or something. And right. it's like, uh, like, okay, so if there's something that kind of contradicts or is a little off from Discovery from another series, I'm like, well, this is a different Star Trek series. It has its own thing. It, it can play by those rules, but it doesn't have to be exact. I mean, when I used to watch Smallville, I wasn't like, well, this doesn't match with the Superman movies or the cartoons. Yeah, but it, it never it never it never set out to. I mean, they told you from the beginning this was a different right. interpretation. Would that be accepted by Star Trek fans if they did that? I think if you came at it from from that perspective from the jump, hey, what we're doing is an offshoot. We're going to reinterpret things like they tried to do with the JJ movies. I don't I don't know if the JJ movies originally had the idea of having this thread with Spock Prime coming in to help tie it off from canon or they just threw a bone for the hardcore fans so that we wouldn't, you know, burn down the theaters when we went to go see the new movies. But I would have been perfectly fine if those had been a complete reboot with no connection to the other universe, to the prime universe. I'd have been okay with it. I mean, I may not have liked them. We don't know. I mean, as they are, I enjoyed them for what they are, which is a modern action oriented version of Star Trek. And there's a place for that kind of thing. Yeah. I think Star Trek is best served on television mm -hmm. uh, by and large, but I'm okay with the roller coaster once in a while. And that's what those movies are. And to be honest, that's what a lot of the other films were too. You know, they were either expanded television shows or they were something completely, you know, off the rails. Yeah, I would I would love the idea of a summer blockbuster style, you know, um, very action oriented Star Trek that showed up every few years on, you know, in the movie screens. I mean, like, imagine Mission Impossible, you know, I mean. But I mean, you know, for every city on the edge of forever or every inner light, there's the Doomsday Machine, which is just a flat out action story. I mean, it's got a story there, but it's an action movie. I mean, can you imagine that thing blown up to $100 million budget? <laughs> and in a two hour film, I think it'd be awesome or balance of terror or something like that. I would love that. Come on, Quentin Tarantino, where the heck are you? But I, I, I think there will be it. There will come a time when somebody decides to completely reinvent Star Trek, meaning the Kirk Spock dynamic and all that. I don't know if we're going to see it anytime soon. I think they're very happy with what they're doing, which is adding another layer to the existing mythos is just doing it in a modern with a modern approach and like i said before as long as the mythology is being observed in the broad strokes at the very minimum but they are digging in and finding ways to connect to the other parts of the canon and i'm okay with it i'm okay with it looking different you know i'm okay with a with a with a different aesthetic if i look up the historical record of james t kirk and all of his accomplishments as i know him from the original series or somewhere in there uh, I'm okay with it. And it's like, you know, when I, I think about Star Trek Picard and of course the novels that went post nemesis are different continuity than what we've seen now in Star Trek Picard. And as you mentioned, there's Star Trek online, which even that's a little different. Mm -hmm. 
I just look yeah. at all three of those equally as just different interpretations. They're different, different interpretations. Directions. Yeah. Yeah. And I would be fine if the novels that we've been getting from you guys just continued on that storyline separate from Picard, but I know probably CBS licensing wouldn't do that, but I, they should listen to me right now. And keep doing <laughs> We're not quite done. We're not done with the novel verse just yet. We got, we got a few tricks up our sleeve. Every time I hear that, I get excited. <laughs> so just, just calm yourselves, calm your jets. It'll get there. So. I, I want the stories that inspire the writers to tell. Tell me something that you think is so cool that you're excited about it. That's the stuff I want to see. That's the stuff I want to read. If it steps on something that I liked when I was 20, I'm okay if it brings the next person who is 20 into Star Trek. And I think there's, to expand on that thought, you know, I've been a fan of Star Trek for as long as I can remember. I watched, you know, reruns of the original show in the 70s when I was five years old. But I'm not the same fan I was when I was five years old. I'm not the same fan I was five years ago. Star Trek is a living, evolving thing. And most fans are to some degree. I don't like all the same things I liked when I was 12. I like probably too many of the things I liked when I was 12. But I, my taste in what I like in a story and the kind of novels I like to read and the kind of stories I like to watch are, have evolved as I've gotten older. And Star Trek has evolved along with me for the most part, but yet there's still undeniably a Star Trek heart beating underneath, you know, to go back to that, to that comparison or to that description. I think even, even now, I mean, you know, the new shows are still reaching for that Star Trek, that, that Star Trek essence that, that is there. I mean, it's just not, it's just not being told or conveyed the same way it was 50 years ago, but you know, I'm not the same fan I was 30 years ago or 20 years ago. So I'm okay with it evolving and becoming more sophisticated and, and more nuanced and, and trying to reach for different things that it reached for 50 years ago. That's what something, that's what you should be doing. If you're still, if you're still reaching for the same things you were reaching for 50 years ago, you're not growing as a person, as a fan. Um, uh, it's just uh, even Star Wars, you know, I still love those original movies. I love Star Wars, the first original film I saw when I was 10 years old, but I liked the fact that over the course of, you know, that mythology expanding, they have tried different things they have reached higher you know they've reached for that piece of fruit that was out of reach before so i love that idea i mean the idea that it should be the same thing that i was watching when i was 10 that's ridiculous keep that star trek heart and use the canon as a guide to tell really awesome stories that you want to tell not as a cage to restrict yourself it's a guideline not a rule yeah it shouldn't be a cage and even you know even and no no less than leonard nimoy said that you know it's like canon is being ex obsessed about the minutiae and not the stories and not the characters and not the message and like that's that's where we should be focusing on that and that's and that's something i think that modern television has done right um i don't necessarily want everything to be you know so knit together that I, I feel like I can't jump in. The TV shows that I'm watching now that I really like are great characters who happen to be doing some really interesting things. I will watch a show with a character and a portrayal that I like maybe longer than I should because I will forgive storytelling deficits if the character's being handled well. I watch Better Call Saul, and I've never seen Breaking Bad. And after this latest season, every review I read of it said, if this show continues on the track that it's on, it will surpass Breaking Bad in quality. I have recently embarked on a rewatch of Star Trek for work purposes. And I'm starting at the beginning and I'm watching everything in broadcast order. So I started with the original series and I'm, up, I'm, I'm, I'm about halfway through Next Gen right now. So watching the original show as it was presented and then watching the films and, and into Next Gen and you see the evolution of Star Trek just between those two incarnations. You know, Star Trek, the original, my first love, but it's interesting to see you know, to rewatch it again in order and watch how the progression of the storytelling and even next generation from its first two seasons into its third and fourth seasons, just the, just the progression of storytelling and the evolution of those characters. It kind of reinforces what I was saying. Star Trek grew up a little bit, you know, not to say that the original series was childish or it's not, that's not it at all. It's just, it, it, it evolved with how stories were told for television and that's how and why it's still here. That's why it continues to thrive. It's just, it's adapting to the medium, the way its audience is evolving. What I really like about as time goes on and we change as we age, but at the same time as new interpretations of Star Trek come out, when I watch old Star Trek, I see it in a different light. 
So each time I watch something that I've seen, you know, 20, 30 times or whatever, I'm picking up something or observing it in a different way. I've told Dan before, even just in my life, you know, watching The Visitor, you know, I related to the Jake character. Now I'm older. I relate more to the dad character of Cisco and that, you know, so it times change and formats will change and our interpretations and the, the way we look at things change. You know, I mean, for my favorite example for Star Trek is my growing appreciation of Star Trek, the motion picture. I mean, when I saw it in 1979, I was, uh, it was, you know, halfway through my sophomore year in high school. I enjoyed it. I mean, it left me wanting. And then Star Trek II happened. And, you know, my friends and I just kind of pretended that Star Trek, the motion picture didn't happen. But now when I watch Star Trek, the motion picture, I see what it is that Robert Wise was, was wanting to do with that story and those characters. There are sections of that movie I find really moving. And that was not the experience I had 40 years ago. I think the rewatch that I'm doing is going to reaffirm my theory, which is it works in all these different formats. Star Trek works in all these different formats. It works as an episodic show. It works as a semi-serialized show. It works as a hardcore serialized show. And it works as film. It's just, I think, I think it just goes to show what we've talked about before. Star Trek is a format that is very robust and very adaptable and you can do all kinds of different things with it and it can all be Star Trek. I don't think there's any one way to tell a Star Trek story. I don't think there's any one kind of Star Trek story. And I, I argue, you know, there are people who say that's not Star Trek. I'm like, why not? So shifting gears a little bit, I kind of want to turn now to Kevin Dilmore because part of the joy of having you on the show today is to be able to talk a little bit about the Hallmark Christmas ornaments for 2020 that are hitting the shelves right about now. Am I correct in that? They, they um, made their debut on Friday. Uh, normally, we um, do not sell ornaments until our annual event of Keepsake Ornament Premiere, which is typically a Saturday and Sunday. But because of various aspects of the pandemic, we opened sales in stores on Friday um, exclusively to uh, Keepsake Ornament Club members. So yeah, they've been out for less than a week. Where's my tree topper, man? Where's my tree topper? Oh, man, that looks good. So why don't you tell us just a little bit about, uh, so the tree topper definitely is kind of a new thing for Star Trek this year. It is, it is new. When the Star Wars tree topper came out and we knew that the Death Star would, was going to be the right you know, thing to put on top. And we, uh, you know, I mean, rigged it up where it's got this cool little light show. It plays the main title theme. It plays the Imperial March. It's, you know, nifty and fun. We thought it was going to sell one year, maybe two years. Well, you know, it's continued to sell. Um, you know, we, we just, we crank it out year after year and people want it and they keep buying it. So when it came down to a Star Trek tree topper, we knew we wanted to have something iconic. You know, is somebody going to want to put a Constitution class ship on the top of the tree and how is it going to look and how would it be positioned what well, is the base of the tree topper for the enterprise was it was originally a concept of would that be our tree topper it plays some songs it flashes colors maybe we even put something like a projector in the top of it that so the ceiling would be you know the enterprise maybe even orbiting you know the tree concepts were just going nuts and finally we decided if we combined the tree topper with our new technology for the storytellers which if people are familiar with star wars storytellers that we did uh, in uh, set year 2017, 2018, and 2019, where you can have one ornament, you can have two ornaments, you can have all seven ornaments, and when you press a button, the story expands to fit what's on your tree. And you, so, but you have to write scripts that are here's what it would do if you have all seven, here's what it would do if you have any combination of six, here's what it would do if you had any combination of five or four, or three, or two. And so, and that's what we did with, uh, with Star Trek. We decided the cool thing would be is, can we create a storyteller that incorporates a tree topper, which Star Wars did not, but also make the tree topper compelling enough that someone would want to purchase it on their own? I don't know if you guys have seen the Star Wars storytellers, or I mean, maybe, I don't know if you've seen them all in action, but this past Christmas season, or holiday shopping season, I went to a local Hallmark go crown store and they had the whole display on the wall but i activated i i made the mistake of activating the storyteller 
for all I know, the damn things are still talking to each other, you know, seven months later. <laughs> I don't know. Because I stood there for a good five to six minutes. I'm like, it's never stopping. It's never stopping. It, yeah, that, that show lasts about nine or ten minutes. One time I went into a Hallmark Gold Crown store when they had when they had that wreath with all of them. And they and I said I worked for corporate. We're supposed to announce, you know, to staff that, you know, hey, we work for corporate so they can ask us questions and blah, blah, blah. They said, So do you work on the ornaments? And I said, yeah, I actually, I helped create and wrote all the script for Star Wars Storytellers. And she, oh, that was you. <laughs> <laughs> My work is done. <laughs> well, if we, because it's Star Trek Storytellers, if we're going to have seven ornaments plus a tree topper, we need to pick an episode where all seven ornaments actually communicate. You know, so I had to, you know, go to them and pitch and say, these are the episodes that have all seven. These are the episodes where the only line this person has is hailing frequencies open or, you know, orbit, orbit established captain or whatever. And so we whittled it and whittled it and whittled it. And, and I got to, these are the three or four that I think are the most compelling that someone could, you know, we could have an eight or 10 minute show that all takes place with like an eight minute version of this, you know, 54 minute episode that is compelling enough and, uh, you know, that people would want to buy all the ornaments and, and press a button and listen to the whole thing. You didn't want to go with Way to Eden, huh? Uh, you know, I thought about <laughs> it, but they would not take my, um, yeah, they wouldn't take my recommendation for a Dr. Severin tree top. No, you could have had a Tongo Rad Con exclusive, man. <laughs> exactly. I mean, yeah. my whole idea it was like, you know, imagine that, you know, that you put Severin's head on the tree, but his <laughs> ears open up like an angel's wings. I thought it'd be perfect. <laughs> So when I went down and I said, okay, here are the three, you know, here are the three or five or whatever they were. And I went in and argued and said, this is the episode that I can make the best eight minute cut of. It's popular. Uh, it's, it's quotable. Uh, I can mix and match these characters and still tell part of a story that makes sense. People actually, I mean, you know, Chekhov actually has something to do. They said, great. And I said, there's only one caveat. <laughs> they said, well, what's that? I said, they're not going to be in uniforms that grandma's going to recognize and uh, which, which almost killed it because they're like, well, somebody's going to walk past this and not recognize that uh, it's Star Trek. And I said, well, what if you just put Star Trek on the bottom of the base, which they did. Now we have over the course of three years, you'll have seven ornaments and a tree topper that tell about a nine or 10 minute version of mirror mirror. Excellent. And I, I love that it's mirror mirror too, because then these are versions of these characters that we've not seen before. So like, you know, the big Star Trek fans like me are like, oh, we get the mirror characters as well. Somebody said, well, how are you able to really even do that? And I said, it's amazing how much you can streamline mirror mirror if you just excise Marlena. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh. Uh, yeah. Because they weren't going to do an eighth ornament. In fact, they told me, they said, we need you to rewrite the show for five. Ooh, oh, wow. I said, what? This is after it was all done. I said, yeah, we've done some consumer research and we've done that. We've run the cost. We've done this. We've done that. We think people are only going to buy five ornaments. So you need to run it for five. I said, well, first off, who are you cutting? And they said, Scotty and Chekhov. And I said, absolutely not. I said, if, if this is your recommendation that we're going to do mirror, mirror without Scotty and Chekhov, I'm out. I said, that's, we're going to lose money and that's irresponsible. And they said, okay, either this will come back to haunt me or it'll be, it'll be okay. But uh, I said, I said, if we go into production and fans know that we are not going to do all seven, they, they won't buy, they won't even buy the first one. How many, how many times over the course of 50 years have we started collecting something that they just abandoned. And I'm looking at you, Gold Key Archives. <laughs> yeah, I was about to use that one myself. <laughs> like, where are you at there, IDW? Huh? But we're doing all seven. If you go to the stores now, you can pick up Sulu, Kirk, and the Tree Topper. Uh, in October, we'll have Lieutenant Uhura. And then we have, we'll have two ornaments um, yet to be named that will, that will uh, be in stores in 2021. And two more ornaments that'll be in stores in 2022. But the story grows each time you uh, add an ornament and whatever combination you want to, you know, if you decide, Hey, you know what? I only want Kirk, Spock and McCoy. Well, that's cool. You can get Kirk, Spock and McCoy and you'll have some of it. You won't have some of the coolest parts. I think people are going to be excited about it. There's lots of little nuances. The one thing I didn't get pushed through that I really wanted was uh, the scene with Kirk 
and Spock walking past the agony booth. I assume you've ordered the full duration. <laughs> so we'd have Kirk and Spock talking. We'd have Chekhov screaming from the tree. <laughs> and the Enterprise, which is the repository for all of the sound effects, would be making that awesome agony booth. <laughs> and all the lights flashing and Chekhov screaming. And I said, what says Christmas more than yeah. this? I was going to say, yeah, it's not Christmas unless Chekhov's screaming in agony. Like, that's, that's the way funny. I looked at it. So, <laughs> yeah, look look, look for our city eel tree topper in 2024. <laughs> There's the three, there'll be three ornaments and the tree topper available in October. But in 2021, when the next two ornaments come out, you'll be able to buy five in the tree topper. The, the, the year one ornaments will be in stores for the second year and the third year. But uh, if you haven't gotten them all by 2022 and you haven't purchased it, when you go to the store in 2023, they won't be there. Well, I I think fans definitely should uh, try and pick those up if they can this year and then over the course of the next few years to get all of them as they come out because it sounds like that love and attention really went into them, which is excellent. I, I mean, I've poured myself into, you know, Star Trek projects and Star Wars projects and, and other licensed projects. But uh, I feel like that, and I told somebody this at work, I said, when this hit stores, I was as proud of this as I was any book that Dayton and I had written. And, to, and, and if that says something, I mean, I'm extremely proud of the stuff that we do. Um, I finally, for the first time ever, you know, made, you know, built a bookcase that has our books together on it. I've never done a brag shelf before, but when I moved into the new house and got new bookcases, I did it. And when I look at it and when, or people come in and say, you know, well, you got a lot of Star Trek books. And I said, yeah, but only the ones we wrote together. And they're like, what? You know, but this, I feel like that, you know, if, if I'm going to have a Hallmark legacy for Star Trek fans, this is it. Well, I guess uh, if uh, people wanted to look you guys up online, find out what you're working on now, where would be the best place to be able to do that? Somebody asked me this for the podcast I was on earlier. I said, well, if you're okay with dealing with my political rantings, then find me on Facebook. (laughs) But if you'd like to read my political rantings, follow me on Twitter. I do have to say, I love your political rantings on Facebook. (laughs) It's great to get a little bit of sanity in some of this world, but uh, anyway. My high school friends sure enjoy it. (laughs) I bet. You can find me on the web at DaytonWard.com, and I I also rant sometimes on Facebook, but I think Kevin is better at it than I am. But And Dayton also has a regular blog um, and on, and a regular contributor to Star Trek.com. So, I mean, I, following him on Facebook, he'll link the, I mean, the blog posts and the, uh, um, and the stuff for Star Trek.com. And, and I guarantee you want to read it. That's and that, none of that's political. I actually don't get too political on my blog. I mean, every once in a while, but I don't really. You get really. I mean, it just got a good nostalgic tone and voice, and no, I I really enjoy your blog posts. I do get a little ranty on Facebook from time to time, but I try to keep it in check. It just depends on how pissed off I am at at certain elements that are in our world today. It's kind of hard these days to. Yeah, uh, I try not to get too wrapped up. I try not to go to bed angry about it. I try. That's the other thing I was, whatever my last post of the day is going to be, I try to make it something fun and entertaining. I don't want it. I don't want people thinking I'm angry going to bed every night. (laughs) You know, I'm like, I'm really not guys. I can compartmentalize this stuff to a pretty good degree. And I like, and, and, and given a choice, I would rather make somebody laugh than make them mad. Well, um, Bruce, where can people find you online? Uh, I'm doing my political ranting uh, at home, but online <laughs> I'm at Admiral <laughs> underscore Rex. And you can find me online at Kurtrats, that's K-E-R-T-R-A-T-S, and on YouTube.com slash Kurtrats Productions. You can find the show at Positively Trek. And look for our Facebook discussion group. We've got a good number of people in there now. Let's get some more in there. Uh, Just search Positively Trek on Facebook and we'll let you right in. Well, thank you all so much for joining us. I've had a wonderful discussion with these two Trek luminaries. It's just always so much fun to have you guys on. Man, if we're we're the luminaries, you need to change your filter. (laughs) 